I invite you to take your Bibles tonight and open to the book of James in the New Testament, James chapter 1. And we've been looking at this the past few weeks here on Wednesday night. And tonight I want you to look at verse 13 of chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 13 down to verse 18. James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So James, in this letter, deals with the issue of genuine faith in the Christian life. Remember, we said that James was the show-me book of the Bible. Don't tell me about your faith. Show me your faith. Show me that you're real. And one of the issues that we've been dealing with so far at the first of James, first of chapter 1 here of James, is you can tell whether or not you're a believer by how you respond to trials. So how do you respond when trials come? The next question that James is going to deal with here is the question of how do I respond to temptation? As a believer, what do you do when you are tempted? How do you deal with sin and temptation in your life? Do you struggle in the area of temptation? It's like one man who said, I can resist anything except temptation. I heard about a young priest who was serving in the confessional booth for the first time. He was being watched over by an older priest. And at the end of the day, the older priest said to the younger priest, he said, look, I know that this is your first time, but when people confess, you have to say something besides wow. So let's talk about temptation. Let's talk about sin. Let me just give you a few preliminary statements here about temptation. The first one I want you to think about is that testing and temptation are not the same. I want to make that very clear. In the first part of chapter 1, James speaks about testing. But now here in these verses that we just looked at, verses 13 down to verse 18, he's dealing with the issue of temptation. And the two are not the same. Sometimes we can get confused over that. And the confusion really comes from the fact that the word for testing or trying in verse 3, the Greek word I should say, and the Greek word for tempting or temptation in verse 13 is exactly the same. For example, we'll look at verse 3 where it says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, look at the word trying there. And then in verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. See the word tempted there, actually used four times in that verse, verse 13. And it's the same Greek word, parasmos. And it can mean either. It can mean you're either being tested by God, or it can mean you're, you're being tempted by the devil. And so whenever this word is being used to speak of God, it's always referring to the fact of testing. That's how we know that it's, uh, what, it, uh, what it means. The context will determine the meaning of the word. Whenever it's used in context of God, it's talking about being tested, your faith being tested. You remember the re- request in Matthew 6.13, lead us not into temptation. There it's used, being used in, re- in respect of God. God, don't lead me into temptation And the prayer there is not that God would lead us into temptation to sin, no, but that God would lead us into testing, testing our faith. And really, it's the cry, it's an emotional plea from a saint who's saying, God, don't lead me into any trial that is more than I can bear. And so sometimes God will test us, but Satan will tempt us. God uses testing to build us up. Satan uses temptation to tear us down. God uses testing to produce sanctification in us. Satan will use temptation to produce sin in us. You see, a a surgeon, when he takes a blade and he he uses it on a person, he has in mind healing. He'll use that blade to bring about healing from that surgery. But you give a blade to a murderer, a psychopathic murderer, and that same instrument can be used to kill, you see. It depends upon the motive and the purpose. Whenever God tests us, it's always for good. Whenever Satan will tempt us, it's always for evil. Second preliminary thought is this. Don't think that temptation will decrease now that you're a Christian. Some people think, oh, now that I'm saved, I won't be tempted so much. Wrong. In fact, you'll probably get tempted more. 
now that you're saved. In fact, the more you try to walk with the Lord and the more godly you try, godliness you try to pursue, the more you're going to have to fight the devil. And the more you're going to have to fight temptation. Look what it says in verse 14. Every man is tempted. Notice it's everyone. Salvation does not decrease temptation. Um, if you have been tempted a lot before salvation, it's probably because you and the devil were going in the same direction. When you, you get saved, you make a 180-degree turn because you repent, right? And now you're walking towards God. Remember Jesus spoke about the two roads in Matthew 7. There's a broad road that leads to destruction. There's a narrow road that leads to life everlasting. I used to picture that in my mind, that the road's going in the opposite direction. But really the way I picture it now is here's this broad road and everyone's on it. But when a person repents, they make a 180-degree turn and now they're going one way on a on a, on a road where everyone's going the opposite direction. The world, now you're facing the world head on. Now you're facing the devil head on. You're going right up the middle of a one-way street going a different direction than everyone else. And so the more you try to live for Christ and walk away from the world, the more you're going to be tempted. You're going to be the target of Satan. Here's the third preliminary thought. Don't think that you can grow to the point where you cannot fall. Beloved, you never get to that point. Just write down in your margin, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he what? Lest he fall. And we know that. That's a warning from Paul about overconfidence. Don't get proud and say, well, it can't happen to me. This can't happen to me. It can happen to you. As I said before, a proud man tempts the devil to tempt him. So with all that in mind, we come to our passage today, and James is trying to teach us about temptation and sin, and there are three major lessons or concepts that we need to consider here. The first one, if you're taking notes, write down the direct cause of temptation. The first thing that we have to know is the cause of it. In order to properly deal with temptation in our life, we've got to know where does it begin? Where does it come from? And James begins by looking around, and the first place he looks is up. <clears throat> Excuse me, he looks upward to deity. Look at verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. James establishes the fact that you cannot blame your temptation or sin on God. Notice where it says, let no man say. This is a third person imperative. That's a strong command. And what that actually means is that people were already rationalizing that God was the cause of their temptation and their sin. They were, they were thinking those thoughts. And James is saying, look, stop thinking that way. God is not the cause of your temptation. Actually, this is middle voice in the Greek, so we can say it like this. Let no one say to himself. And so this was happening. They were rationalizing in their mind. They were saying to themselves. They got into temptation. They sinned, and they said to themselves, oh, well, you know, God did this. He put me in this, and so he must have wanted this to happen. And so they're kind of, in a way, pointing to God. But James says, let no man say when you're tempted, you're tempted of God. The preposition there is not the normal preposition, hoopo, but it is an apo, which is the idea of remoteness. Don't even think remotely, or, or, or God remotely has anything to do with your temptation. All right? He may allow it, but he's not the cause of it. He's not the agency of it. And so don't blame it on God. Don't lay it at God's feet. Now, this was the way that they were thinking back in James' day. Uh, in fact, there were some Jewish rabbis in that day that believed that God was at least indirectly responsible for sin and temptation. They believed that God gave them what they called the Yatzer Hara, that is, the evil impulse. And so since God gave them this somehow, indirectly, God was at least responsible the Greek scholar Zodiates says, this is how they reasoned in their mind, quote, God has ordained that I should yield to the temptation under which I have fallen. I've been driven to sin, not by God himself, since God hates sin, but by the very circumstances in which God has placed me. God is the ultimate cause. Therefore, I should absolve myself of the responsibility, end quote. It's an easy way to just, you know, hey, it was God. I'm not responsible, God is. We believe that God is sovereign, but friend, man is also responsible. And you don't think, let sovereignty think, cause you to think fatalistically the way he just described the thinking of the people there. 
You have a choice when it comes to sin and temptation, and that choice is your choice. It's a very real choice. It's so real that you're going to be judged by God for that choice that you make. But this doesn't go just back to James Day. We can go back, a whole, go back a whole lot earlier, all the way back to Adam in the garden, and you know the story there. When Adam sinned, remember what he said to God? The woman that thou gavest me was her. I, I, mean, <clears throat> I mean, you think about it, God. I, I went to sleep single, and I woke up married. It wasn't my idea. I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't my idea to get married. You gave her to me. <clears throat> she ate the fruit. Then she gave me the fruit. What was I supposed to do? And Eve's excuse was no better. She said, well, the serpent, he deceived me. So we're just shifting the blame. It's like the one country preacher said, Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the serpent. The serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. I expect you to laugh at those jokes. Whether you think they're funny or not, I would like appreciate a courtesy laugh. It's too late. Right. So in a way, they were actually saying it was God's fault. You know, God, you put us in this environment. And uh, so really, the responsibility goes with you. But, but this is the way people think even in our day today. People are still have this mentality that it's not my fault. I'm a victim. That's the mentality of our society today. Everyone is a victim. Everyone is trying to blame their sin on somebody else. But James here says, look, you can't blame God. Stop trying to blame God. Because notice what it says, again, in verse 13. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. First of all, God himself can't be tempted with evil. Remember the word parosmos? You put the alpha negative in front of that, a parosmos, not temptable. That's the word here. God is not temptable. You can't tempt him. You know why? He's completely holy. And you can't tempt holiness with sin. But along with that, neither tempts he any man. Before you can tempt a man with evil, you have to be evil yourself. And since God is holy, it's impossible for him to be tempted, and it's impossible for him to tempt others with sin or evil. Satan, who is sinful, he wants to export sin, but God, who is holy, wants to export holiness. And so he can't blame God. Now, people in society today, they don't really come right out and say, well, it's God's fault. They just, they, they find another way to say it, you know. But whatever, the, whenever they say, it's not my responsibility, I'm a victim, they're trying to push it off on someone else. It's the parents that God gave me, they didn't raise me right. It was a place where I was raised. I learned all these things from the environment that, that I was put in, which again, points to God. It was just, it's just the way that I am. It's, it's the glands I Uh, inherited from my parents, but it's just not my fault. Uh, The headline of an advice column kind of summed up the way people think in our generation, where it says the headline was, it's not your fault. And it goes on to talk about a woman who had written in to say that she had tried everything she could, every form of therapy, and still could not break this self-destructive habit. And so the columnist responds to her, listen to what the columnist said. The first step you must take is to stop blaming yourself. Your compulsive behavior is not your fault. Refuse to accept blame. Above all, do not blame yourself for what you cannot control. And that's the thinking of the modern culture today. What article went on to say, you know, you, you're heaping guilt on yourself. Guilt is such a a negative emotion. But, you know, really, guilt is a gift from God, and what it reveals is that your conscience actually is working there. And guilt is designed to drive a soul to God. But what we've done in our world today is we've said that's a negative emotion. We just have to get rid of the guilt. We have to ignore the guilt, find someone else to blame. And so rather than a soul being driven to God, we're making ourselves a victim. So it's not working the way God wanted it to work. So... Again, we just find whatever we can blame. Uh, The author of the book, The Vanishing Conscience, talked about when the mayor of San Francisco, this was many years ago, uh, George Mascone was uh, murdered by a fellow supervisor, and the excuse that was used at the court trial of this man who murdered the mayor was, 
that he, he did it because he ate too much junk food. And this became uh, especially, and I'm not kidding, I'm not making this up, especially ho- Hostess Twinkies made him act irrational. And so thus the famous Twinkie defense was born. A lenient jury brought a, a verdict of involuntary manslaughter rather than murder. And the man, uh, by the way, they ruled, let me quote, diminished mental capacity was the reason that this man acted the way he did. And this man was out of prison before the next mayor's term would have been completed. Just a few months in jail. And that's our society. There was a man who was shot and paralyzed while committing a burglary in New York. And uh, he took the store owner to court because the store owner shot him. And his attorney told the jury that this man who robbed the store, first of all, he was a victim of society driven to crime by economic disadvantage. And the lawyer said he's a victim of the insensitivity of the man who shot him. And because of that man's callous disregard of the thief's play as a victim, the poor criminal will be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. He deserves some redress. And the jury agreed, and the store owner had to pay the man a large settlement. Several months later, this same man in his wheelchair was arrested while committing another armed robbery. And friend, that's again, that's the mentality. It's just we never take responsibility. We, we blame our circumstance. We blame everything else around us. But what is God's role? You write down in your margin, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, will not suffer you to be attempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. Distilled in that one verse tells us God's role in temptation. What is God's role? Well, first of all, he never allows you to be tempted above what you're able. It's never something too strong for you to handle. You can't use the excuse and say, I was just completely overwhelmed by this temptation. I had no choice. No, God will not allow you to be tempted to where it totally overwhelms you. Also, you can't use the excuse, well, this temptation was unique. No one's ever been tempted like me in this situation. Wrong. The Bible says, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. You're not unique in, the, in temptation. But also, God will always provide a way out. So every temptation that you face is controlled by God. He'll never let it overwhelm you to the point where you have no choice. It's, it's common to man. You'll never get tempted in a way that no one else has been tempted and it's conquerable. You can, you can say no. You have a choice. There's a door of escape. God makes sure that happens in every temptation. And so you can't blame anyone else. You can't blame God. So where does temptation come from? Well, secondly, James looks not only upward to deity, but then he looks inward to desire. Look at verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Temptation is an inside job. It starts with inward desires. It comes from our own sinful nature. It comes from our own lust. Mark 7, 21, Jesus said this, for for from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murder, thefts, covetous wickedness, Deceit, lewdness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. And James says, this is where it starts. You're drawn away of your own lust. Look at the word drawn away there. It's the idea of being dragged away as a prisoner. Sin enslaves you. It drags you into captivity. This is the same word used in the Septuagint to speak of Joseph being dragged away into captivity. And notice it's the word lust, general word for strong desire. We become captive to our own desires. We become prisoners to our lust. We are enslaved to it. Desires themselves are not sinful. It's when we allow those desires to draw us away, to overcome us. It's a a desire that is something that, that draws you outside the will of God. Sleeping is normal. Laziness is a sin. 
Marital intimacy is normal. Adultery and immorality is a sin. It's when these legitimate desires attach themselves to an evil thing. When routine desires become runaway desires. And this doesn't happen overnight. I think it was Bob Jones Sr. who said, behind every tragedy of human failure, there has been a long process of evil thinking. If you don't win the battle on the inside, you don't win the battle. It's the inward lust that you have to deal with. In the book, The Anatomy of Secret Sins, written by the Puritan Obadiah Sedgwick, he said this about inward sin. When they are kept off the stage of the world, they are like a fire in a chimney. Though you do not see it, yet it burns. Inward desire is kind of like a fire inside of you. He compares it to an inward disease that will eventually break out. He says, beloved, the main battle of a Christian is not in the open field. His quarrels are mostly within, and his enemies are within his breast. And that's true. So he looks upward to God and says, you can't blame God. He looks inward to desire and says, that's where it starts. The inward sin nature, the lust. But then he looks outward to deception. Look again at verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust, and look at that next word, enticed. And this is the idea of to lure away. And really, it's the idea of baiting a hook or being snared in a trap, like a hunter will try to catch his prey, or a fisherman will try to lure a fish onto his line. In fact, when a fisherman goes fishing, he uses what? A lure, right? Some of you fishermen out there. And you know what you do? You put a, you put a lure there, and, and basically, here's Mr. Bass, and he has an inward desire, and it's to eat. But here you have this lure, and you're drawing him away. And actually, you're lying to him because you're saying, I want to bless you, Mr. Bass. I want to feed you a free meal. And you hide the hook. You, you guys should repent of your fishing, I should tell you right now. I'm just kidding. But that's exactly what the devil does. The devil says, I want to be a blessing to you. I want to give you something free. It's never free. And he'll hide the hook. And that's when sin takes place. It starts with the inward desire. There's the inward desire. There's the outward deception. And when those two things meet together, James says that's where sin comes from. And this is the second thing. We see the direct cause of temptation. You can't blame God. It's the inward desire. It's the outward um, desire. Direction that you use, the outward deception, I should say. Number two, the deadly course of temptation. Because notice in verse 15, he kind of describes to us the end result of the temptation in verse 15. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. I think one of the best ways to overcome temptation is to understand where sin leaves you. The end result. What's the end result of it? The end result is death. The end result is misery. So notice, again, what James is giving us here is the analogy of a birth. There's the conception. When lust has conceived, verse 15, the parents of sin are inward lust, outward temptation. When these two come together, the conception then has taken place, and then there's the the child, we could say, which is sin. In verse 15, when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And you can't hide the child. It's going to come forth. Again, Obadiah Sedgwick wrote this, Beloved, remember this, that that though the first ground of sin is within the heart, yet the propensity of sin is to come forth in the public. You're never going to be able to hide your sin forever. It's going to come out eventually. You can't hide that child. You can't hide your sin very long. And what's the completion? We see the conception, the child, the completion, it's death. When lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. When sin is done, the completion of it, the end result of it is death. Now, Satan doesn't want you to see the end result. He wants you to think about the fun along the way. He wants you to think about the pleasure, and there's pleasure in sin for a season, but in the end, it's always death, always. There was a pastor in Florida. He had a church close to a brewery, 
And the brewery put up a big billboard sign, billboard sign right out there, not far away from his church. And on the billboard sign, it had a, a man with a tuxedo, and it had a woman in an evening gown, and, and they were drinking, and, and it was just this beautiful scene of distinction and class, according to the world. And at the bottom was the caption at the billboard sign, and it read, the finest product of the brewer's art. That's what the devil wants you to think about. Sin is the finest product. We're going to really make you happy by giving you this. But then that preacher, this is what he did. He hired a commercial artist. He had a billboard right there by his church. He put up a billboard sign, and it was a picture of a man laying in the gutter in his own filth and vomit. And he put the bottom, the caption at the bottom was, the finished product of the brewer's art. A little bit of play on words there. Very effective message. Because what the devil wants you to see is the finest product. He doesn't want you to see the finished product. And the finished product is always bad. It's always death. And see, James is telling us here, look, the end result of sin is death. It brings forth death. Some people say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing whatever I want. I'm fine. Well, sin isn't finished yet. It's not finished. The finished product is always death. And sin will not let you go until uh, it ends, until it's complete, their completion has taken place. That is, unless you repent towards God, then you can uh, get victory over it. But short of that, the end result of sin is death. Sin's, sin's like a prison keeper. It's not going to let you go until it's finished with you. A man had a basket of beans in his arm, and he was dropping those beans, and behind him was a a row of pigs gobbling them up. And one man said, that's a funny way to feed your your pigs there. He said, I'm not feeding them. He said, I'm leading them to the slaughterhouse. And that's exactly what uh, sin does and what Satan does. So notice the third thing. There's the direct cause of temptation, the deadly course Lust, sin, and death. Someone said that's the devil's LST. But then let me give you the third thing, the definite cure. Because this is what we really want to focus on. How do I overcome temptation? Well, look at verse 16. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good and perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no veritableness, neither shadow of turning. So James gives us solid advice on overcoming temptation. You know where it starts? Remember I said you have to win the battle on the inside? It starts with right thinking. That's why he says, do not err. Don't go off course in your thinking. This is a prohibition imperative. We could literally say it like this. Stop being deceived. Stop thinking wrongly about God. Because that's where Satan has you. Evidently, there were some people in the church that James was writing to that were already having the wrong thoughts about God and sin and temptation. They were entertaining some of Satan's lies. They were thinking wrong thoughts about God. And when you're going through a trial, there's a tendency for someone to go through this trial and say, why is God putting me through this? This is not fair. I've tried to do the right thing. And if you're not careful, you get these negative thoughts about God. And if you start getting negative thoughts about God, Satan's got you right there. Because then you become vulnerable. Oh, I deserve better. And Satan standing there on the side saying, oh, yeah, I can give you better. If you want better, just trust me. I'll be able to do that for you. Yeah, you're right. You know, why would God treat you that way? You deserve better than that. And then you're vulnerable there. And so James says, look, it starts with thinking correctly about God. Stop having negative thoughts about God. If Satan can get you dissatisfied and discontent with your present circumstances, he can really work wiles in your life. He wants you to be dissatisfied. He wants you to be angry at God. He wants you to lack confidence in the goodness of God. A single person why, wonders, why, why hasn't God given me a mate? A married person wonders, why have you given me this mate? Some people think God's trying to rob me of pleasure. He's trying to rob me of fun. And God's ripping us off. Erwin Lutzer wrote this, When you doubt God's goodness, you hug sin tightly to your bosom. 
afraid that God will rob you of your crutch. And so the first thing James says is you've got to stop thinking negatively about God or despise what God has done in your life already. Stop doing that. Secondly, the right theology. Look, at, look in verse, not only stop wrong thinking, but the right theology. Start thinking correctly about God. Look in verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there's no veritableness, neither shadow of turning. Here James is very theological. He gives us some wonderful theology that will help us in an hour of temptation. And what he teaches us about, about here is the character and nature of God. God is a good God. He's good. And there's some several facts about the goodness of God. First of all, he only gives good gifts. Again, in verse 17, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Two different words for gift here. Every good gift, every perfect gift. One refers to the actual gift. The other refers to the way in which God gives it. God gives us good gifts, but in the way he gives it is also good. He's very gracious and kind in the way he gives that gift. So we have to remember that God is the giver of all the good things that we have. You don't think God's been good to you? If you don't think he has, then Satan has you. Remember when David sinned against Bathsheba and God sent Nathan the prophet to speak to David about it? And you know one of the things that Nathan, we kind of missed that in the story, what he said, but what he said was basically this, you have despised the gifts that I've given you. You know the reason you did what you did? You thought lightly about what I've already given you. You despise the grace of God. I have, look at all I've given you, and I would have given you more. But you despise what I gave you. And when you despise what God's already given you, you're way open for temptation. No, God gives us, and, and David already knew, it. God had given David every good and perfect gift. And what we have in our life are good gifts. He's good to us in what he gives, and you know what? He's good to us in what he withholds. Not just what he gives, but what he withholds. You think you need it? God knows you better than you know you. You don't need it. God knows it'll hurt you. It's, it'll, it'll, it's not good for you. If, if it was good for you, God would give it. And so he gives good gifts the way he gives them are good, but also God's giving is constant. Look again in verse 17. Every good and perfect gift come from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. This is a, a, a present participle. It keeps coming down. God doesn't just give us one thing at one time. He just constantly is giving. Not occasional, but constant gifts. You know how many gifts you've been given today from God? He gave you a good night's sleep. He gave you food to nourish you. He gave you sunlight. He gave you clothes to wear, a roof over your head. He gives you lungs. He gives you air to breathe. He gives us people to love. He gives us friends, family. All these are good gifts from God. Even the dark providences that we have in our life, in a way, they, they're gifts. We don't recognize it at the time. But in the end, I, I've talked to some Christians where they say, you know, this happened in my life. It was a dark time. I look back on it now, years removed. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. I didn't think that at the time, but I can see now. God gives only good gifts. The way God gives is good. God's giving is constant every day. His mercies are new every morning. And God doesn't change. Look again in verse 17 where it says, From the Father of lights, with whom there is no veritableness, neither shadow of turning. God does not change. He's called the Father of lights. This is an ancient reference to God as the creator. The lights are the sun, the moon, and the stars. And James, I think, chooses this title because it fits his illustration. You know, the sun, the moon, and the stars, they're always there. They're always shining. From our perspective, it looks like they're changing, right? They appear, disappear. Sometimes we can't see the sun, but it's still there. From our perspective, it looks like they're constantly changing, but they're not changing at all. And our circumstances may seem to us to make it appear as if God has changed, but he hasn't changed, not at all. The Bible says in Malachi 3.6, I am the Lord, I change not. 
This is the character of God that we call immutability. He doesn't change. Uh, one theologian said it like this, God is unchanging in his being and his perfections and his purpose and his promises. Yet he does act and feel emotions. When we say that God is immutable, it doesn't mean he's immobile. He will meet us at our, our whatever circumstance we're going through, and he will give us what we need at that time. When we say that God is immutable or unchanging, we don't mean that God is not there with us, responding differently in different situations. We know that he's also imminent as, as far as transcendent. What it means is, is that he doesn't change in his character in his perfections, in his purposes, or in his promises. And you know what that means? I'm running out of time. I wish I had more, but you know what that means? It means that God, his favor towards you, his grace towards you, his love towards you, that never changes. His favor and grace is the same towards you as ever. God's gracious disposition towards you, his child, will never change. He cannot love you more than he loves you now. He will not love you less, no matter what the circumstances are, because he does not change. One day Spurgeon and his friend were walking through the countryside, and they saw a barn, and on the top was this weather vane, and on the weather vane it said, God is love. And the friend of Spurgeon said, that doesn't seem like an appropriate place to put a weather vane. Weather vanes are changeable, but God's love is constant. And Spurgeon says, no, the meaning of that is, no matter which way the wind blows, God is love. No matter what, God is love. God's not moody. He doesn't have a bad day. You don't have to go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, are you okay? Are you mad at me? I mean, he doesn't have a bad day. You know, you laugh, but that actually happened. Benny Hinn was interviewing Jesse Duplantis on TVN. And Jesse Duplantis said, you know, I got up to pray that morning and God wasn't acting just right. He said, so I just said, you know, God, are you okay? And God said, well, you know, Jesse, my people down there, they've been hurting me. And Jesse said, you know what, God, I'm going to cancel all my appointments. I'm going to spend all my day with you. And God said, thank you, Jesse. So God needed Jesse's help to get through a bad day. That's what we're supposed to believe. And I want to tell you something, friend, that's blasphemous. That's blasphemous. Job said this, if you have sinned, what do you accomplish against him? You think you can give God a bad day? You don't have that ability. His character, his being, his person, it's immutable. You can't touch that. You can't make him any more happy than he is, any more blessed than he is, and you can't give God a bad day. But his love, like the sun, is always shining towards you, always, no matter what. John Oxham wrote this, Never since the world began has the sun ever stopped the shining. His face very often we cannot see. We grumble at his inconsistency, but the clouds were really to blame, not he. For behind them he was always shining. And so behind life's darkest clouds, God's love is always shining. We veil it at times with our faithless fears. We darken it with our foolish tears. But in time the atmosphere always clears for his love is always shining. He does not change towards you. And so don't believe the devil who's trying to get you to think negatively about God. Oh, God, he's treating you bad. He's not being fair towards you. No, we need to say to the devil that his compassions fail not. Great is God's faithfulness, just like the song says. Let me give you the last thing, and we're done. Number five, it's God's greatest gift is salvation. Look what he says in verse 18. Of his own will begot he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This verse speaks about the gift of salvation, being born into the family of God. It was a gift that God gave you. It was not your idea, it was his. It was not your initiative, it was God's. It wasn't because of your will, it was because of his will. He makes that very clear. Of his own will begot he us with the word of truth. It was through the word of God that God did it. He made us of the finest of his creation. We were the first of his creation, the first fruits literally. So you, as a child of God, to whom he has given salvation, you are precious in his sight. You are the first fruits of all of his creatures.
And so you have to remember that. Anytime you have the tendency to think negatively about God, just remember you're saved. He saved you from hell. He's graciously loved you, given you his grace. And he doesn't change. He doesn't change. So that's the cure for, for temptation. Remember who God is. Remember what he's given you. Remember his giving is constant. Remember his greatest gift is in salvation. Let's pout for prayer together tonight as we're out of time. So, Father, I pray that you will help us to apply this. A lot of times when we go through trials, we have those negative thoughts. Satan might put in our mind about you. Lord, help us to reject those. Help us to think right theology, correctly, biblically, about who you are. And know that, Lord, you're the giver of every good and perfect gift. You are the father of lights, and you do not change. And your love towards us does not change. And your purpose in our life does not change. And you are accomplishing your purpose, even in the midst of the trials and the dark providences that you bring our way. At the time, we can't see what you're doing, but years removed, we'll look back and know that, again, it's, it was a good and perfect gift. It was necessary. And so, Lord, help us to overcome this, the devil's wiles and to be strong in the midst of our testing and not allow ourselves to be drawn away. Give us that strength. And how many here will say, that's my prayer tonight, that God will give me the wisdom and the strength to see and think correctly about who he is. God help me. Maybe you're in the midst of a testing right now. Satan wants to take advantage of you. God, give me the grace to apply this. Father, bless your word. Help us to apply these truths to our heart and our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.